is ready to go. And away we go with ACC Baseball. We thank you for joining us tonight. Griff O'Farrell starts it for the Virginia Cavaliers and Santucci. Already off to a better start, right, Jack, than he was in his uh, appearance last week against NC State when he opened with seven straight balls. Very uncharacteristic for him. And he's got O'Farrell at 0-2 to start the game. For college baseball fans around, you're probably familiar with the start. He walks seven high. That's not only a season high, but a career high for Santucci on the mound. But many people forgot he did go five and two-thirds of no-hit baseball <laughs> against the Wolfpack in what was a really bizarre weekend. And you know that he wants to be that guy, that Friday night stud, to take the ball and put his team on the back this afternoon. These teams faced each other six times last year, three in the regular season and three in that super regional in Charlottesville. But Santucci was injured last year and did not pitch again. him. So these Cavs are seeing him for the first time. O'Farrell rifles that one into the gap in left center, but Macon Winslow is there to track it down for the first out of the game. All right, for this potent Virginia lineup, following Griff O'Farrell at shortstop, Bobby Whalen is heading his way to the plate now. He's the Virginia center fielder who will bat second in the Cavaliers' batting order. Casey Salky will hit third, play right field. Henry Ford, the only freshman in the lineup, is the cleanup batter at first base. Harrison Didowick in left. Jacob Ferentz catching. Henry Godbout at second base. Ethan Anderson, the DH tonight. And they platoon at third base. And with the left-hander on the mound, the right-handed hitting Luke Hansen will bat ninth and play third base. And Bobby Whalen takes one on the outside corner to even the count at one and one. Everybody in this lineup, Jack, is hitting 300 or better, and nobody better than Whalen, who is at 410. A really talented young man that's bounced around. When you talk about the landscape of college baseball, take Whalen some time to find his perfect home. Man, Charlottesville's happy to call him their own, his ability to patrol center field, but he has been the prototypical two-hole in this lineup. Transfer from Indiana, and he will force Santucci to throw another pitch here at one ball and two strikes. Virginia at 21-4. and four. Cavs have won six in a row. So they're coming in feeling pretty good. The 21 wins, Jack, really significant for them. This is the third straight year they have had 20-plus wins before playing 25 games. There's a swing and a miss, and Santucci off to a great start here, retiring the first two Cavalier batters. Uh, Brian O'Connor was talking about that. He's like, you know what? If we've got 20 wins before we have five losses, I think we're doing pretty well. I, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm telling you, that math is pretty easy. This team has become a walking super regional ball club. Like, you just understand that when you show up to the ballpark, it doesn't matter whether it's going to be on both sides of the ballpark. Fielding, defense, pitching, hitting. They're just such a well-rounded program, and they've built a standard of excellence here in the ACC. Casey Salky, the number three hitter in Coach O'Connor's lineup. He's batting 394, seven homers, 30 runs batted in. But Santucci doing a great job getting ahead of these outstanding Cavalier hitters. No balls and two strikes way ahead here on Salky. We'll see if he comes right after him or if he tries to get him to chase something. Well, he threw that one about five feet in front of home plate. I don't mind it when you got a backstop back there. And Alex Stone, a staple in this Duke lineup. For Santucci, the confidence being able to throw to Stone, that rapport is so strong. Two balls and two strikes now. Yeah, that start last week, and you did that game, right, at NC State. He threw those seven balls to start the game. Very uncharacteristic. Then he struck out four in a row, right? He struck out the side in the first, first batter in the second. And on brand, we haven't really gotten dive into this stuff, but college baseball fans know this is one of the elite lefties in the country. When you think of Hayden Smith, you better be thinking of Jonathan Santucci right behind him. Getting to talk with Coach Pollard. It was this weekend, a year ago, where he was out with that elbow. He has come back with vengeance and been electric this season. He has come back better than ever, and he proves it here in the first inning as he strikes out. Some. Winslow in left, Devin Obie in center, and Chase Cruson, the designated hitter for Coach Chris Pollard's Duke Blue Devils, who bat for the first time now after Santucci set him up and down in order in the top of the first. And Morris, the VMI transfer, takes a strike to start the Blue Devils here in the bottom half of the first inning. One ball, one strike. Morris batting at 366. Good power out of that leadoff spot. Nine homers, 28 runs batted in. I think I'll be repetitive on that, Jack, when I say good power because virtually everybody in their lineup has good power. 
But it is rare, though, in the sense to see a leadoff guy flex not only the ability to yank a ball out of the ballpark, but how many leadoff guys in the country have you seen hit half of their home runs to right center field? Great power the opposite way and into the gap. He's behind here at one and two. And he let that one come in and hit him. He took one for the team there on an off-speed pitch up and in and just twisted so it hit his shoulder, and they got a leadoff base runner. You know, OBP's going to skyrocket. I mentioned that breaking ball so important for Cullen McKay early on to kind of this one just gets away from you. You can see behind the plate, you're setting up on that outside corner. This just slips right out the hand. And Zach Morris has just felt like he's gotten on all year. 463 OBP clip coming into this one. Let's see that number rise. So a leadoff runner for the Blue Devils for Ben Miller, and he goes first ball swinging and spins it foul. To the backstop behind home plate. Local guy coming home after playing at the University of Pennsylvania in the Ivy League. Blue Devils third baseman. Morris at first base is the Blue Devils stolen base threat with six and eight attempts. That was a long hold by McKay trying to break up the timing there of both batter and runner, huh? Especially batter when you got a guy that climbs in, hit 444. <laughs> but how about 417 in ACC play? The volume is this is his 100th at bat of the season for Miller. This kid, his, you're going to talk about the ability to hit the ball the other way. He was a career 350 plus hitter at the Ivy League ranks, an all elite first team mustache as well as March has treated Miller well. This has become a staple of his game, but have loved that in the college baseball world, the two hole, right? Let's feed the most, I guess, dangerous hitter in that two hole. Or oftentimes you'd see a guy like Miller sit in that three, four cleanup spot. College baseball coaches around the country have kind of evolved into let's get this guy more at bats. And especially with how good 8 9 has been for Duke, they're constantly runners on for Miller, who's also got 27 RBIs on the season. Behind here, nothing in two. In the gap in left center field, that's going to fall. It'll split the alley. Morris is on his way to third, picking him up and putting him down. And he's coming home. And it's an early lead for the Blue Devils on the RBI double by Ben Miller. Plating Zach Morris. How about his team high? Nationally ranked as well. His 13th double on the season. That's just a cement mixer over the heart of the plate. A bat head that's in the zone for it seems like an hour and a half. Man, Zach Morris. Not saved by the bell, but how about ring that bell? Duke scratches first. And Morris was coming all the way. Ty Blankmeyer, the third base coach, was waving him home, but he didn't need that. Morris had that ball right out in front of him in left center field and scored easily from first. Just the start the Blue Devils wanted tonight. Although maybe I should correct myself, Jack. Maybe it's the start that Virginia wants tonight because of all their comeback wins. Cardiac calves, as we've called them, and known to grow in love. We'll talk a little bit more of that. Thank beep in this game is with Duke too, kind of off of last week's loss to NC State. They wanted to make sure that they made an impression felt against one of the hottest teams in the country. Mm -hmm. This is one of the best freshmen, perhaps, in the country. Certainly, if you listen to Chris Pollard sing his praises about Gracia, batting at 341, seven homers, 32, runs batted in. And he swung through that pitch and is behind 0-2. Oh, that was strike three, I beg your pardon. And Gracia strikes out for the first out of the inning. Tempo and pace. Don't want to back up that slider, especially the right. Look how much two-seam run he gets on that 93 mile per hour fastball. We drop it in some analytical junky nerd type <laughs> stuff if you guys will hang with me. But just got the number two from our guys across the hall. How about 107 off the bat for Ben Miller on that double? Yeah, he rocketed it. He rifled that into left center. Now Logan Bravo, the first baseman, batting at 323, five homers, 24. Driven in, and you know the Blue Devils would like to get another one here in the first. And they're going to get it. That's almost in the same spot. Splitting the gap in left center. Miller will trot home with the second run, and Bravo is standing at second with a ringing double to left center. 
The Ivy League pipeline does it yet again. Logan Bravo, the Harvard grad. Look at this, exact same pitch too. It's a breaking ball that doesn't necessarily bite. That bat head again, just so clean. Is this middle lineup when you talk about plate efficiency covering both sides. This is a big kid that wants to get his hands extended. He gets a mistake and he doesn't miss. So the Blue Devils have roughed up Colin McKay here in the bottom half of the first inning. They've got a couple in. They got Bravo at second and still only one out for the veteran catcher, Alex Stone. Stone batting at 255, six homers, 19 runs batted in. So an excellent start for Duke on their home field tonight. You know these Blue Devils have been waiting for this. One ball, one strike. All six of those games last year against UVA came in Charlottesville, the three-game series jack in the regular season, which Duke won two out of three. And then the, the gut-wrenching Super Regional in Charlottesville after winning the first game, Virginia came back and really dominated games two and three. Yeah, we don't want to... <laughs> beat a dead horse but when you talk about the super regional rematch right this means a lot to a lot of these kids a lot of them played in omaha last year when you talk about that virginia dugout and duke who's looking to kick down the door their mantra this entire season go back to omaha for the first time since 1961 they've got the right guys to do it that's through into left field bravo had to wait to make sure the ball was going to get through so he'll only move up 90 feet but still it's another hit here in the bottom half of the first inning is Alex Stone with a seeing eye single to left. Again, this is another breaking ball that he starts on that front hip. Actually a much better pitch, but this is Alex Stone. Has an offense behind him that can get him back in the game in a hurry, and he needs to minimize the damage now and get his team to the dugout. And I think that conversation, too, was understand that, hey, we've got one of the best offenses in the country. Mm -hmm. Let's take a deep breath, minimize the damage. We saw that change up to Stone. Maybe that's the pitch he goes to. As I know, he hasn't been able to really execute that breaking ball with a lefty in the box. Get ready for a healthy dosage of changeup. Wallace Clark, that lefty, and he takes that one just off the corner. And one ball and one strike. Clark at 254, four homers, 21. Runs batted in. And you know McKay is thinking a ground ball at somebody here. And with one pitch, he could get out of the inning. Misses outside with that one. Two and one. McKay in that last start at Pittsburgh, Jack. Five innings, three hits, just a couple of earned runs. That's the game he struck out a career high 10 a week ago. And now three and one on Clark. Like it, I know I sounded a little trivial, but when I made sure to tell you it's a lot of different type of hitters this is exactly what i'm talking about the oklahoma transfer wallace clark being really selfless here this isn't you know a suicide squeeze spot this is hey i'm just trying to advance a runner maybe bring a guy in force virginia's defense to have to make a play and he had a hitter's count but really good discipline at the plate and he takes that one up and away and now duke has the bases loaded still only one out here in the first and a chance to break this thing wide open and I'll tell you what, for the Cavaliers, Jack, this might feel like deja vu. Tuesday night, they were at home against Richmond and the Spiders with a grand slam in the top of the first inning to take a 4 nothing lead. Now, a grand slam here would make it a little bit worse because they already have two in. But my point being, they came back in that game and wound up actually routing Richmond 15-5 to after trailing 4 nothing. When we talk about the cardiac cast, four times this year they've erased a four-run deficit. So we know the power in that offensive group, but they haven't faced anybody like a Jonathan Santucci. That might be a deficit that Santucci goes, oh, you want to talk about pitching with confidence, give me a four-run lead. Oh, boogity boogity boys, we're off <laughs> racing. Yeah, that's the X factor there is who's on the mound for Duke. And he's enjoying watching this from the Blue Devils dugout. The 2-0 lead at the moment. A ball and two strikes on Macon Winslow. The freshman in this starting lineup. And he's batting 321, four homers, 13 runs batted in. Certainly wants to put it in play somewhere here. But he does not. A pitch low and away. And he chased it. That is a huge strikeout for McKay. Really talented freshman that we're going to talk about not only just tonight, but the entire weekend being an X factor that surprised a lot of these two coaching staffs. But how about the spot from Colin McKay? This is a must-have punch-out spot. I'm looking to induce a double play. I'm looking to punch a guy out to make sure he's straining some runners. That's the best breaking ball McKay's thrown to this point. 
And he's trusting his catcher on that one too, right? They bounce it up there and know that he's going to block it, not allow the runner from third to score and get a strikeout as well. Lofty shoes was Jacob <laughs> Frentz filling from a season ago. He's been unbelievable. The D2 transfer, not only offensively, the numbers speak volume, but handling this staff that we mentioned has been dinged up. It's been a lot of new faces. He's been such a pleasant, not surprise, but huge lift for the Cavs. And McKay now finds himself one good pitch away from getting out of this inning with relatively minimal damage, right? Just the, the two runs. Blue Devils with the bases loaded and now two outs. Devin Obi trying to keep it alive. One ball, two strikes. And there's that. We've seen two different shapes, that curveball and that slider. That's a curveball that it feels like he just hasn't necessarily been able to get on top of. He misses on that side of the plate yet again. I expect to go back to the fastball and challenge OB up in the zone. Fouled that one off to stay alive at a ball and two strikes. Yes, a better breaking ball. It's still up in the zone, right? Like you're ahead in the count. I'd like to see him try to get OB to chase a little bit. OB, who wants to cut down on the strikeout numbers, but is definitely enjoying his best season to date as a Blue Devil. Batting 367, six homers. Oh boy, that just missed off the outside corner. Ferentz held it there for quite a while. It allowed Jeff Geisney, the home plate umpire, to take a look. See, much sharper. Great slider, but you can see Ferentz is kind of set up on that outside mm -hmm. corner, tries to steal one. Great take by Obi. Now a 2 2 pitch. And this time he gets him, painting the outside corner Take to a 2 0 lead. First pitch outside to the freshman, the only freshman in the Virginia starting lineup tonight, Henry Ford, who is having a phenomenal rookie year. Gets the jump to it. Oh, batting at 379, seven homers, 34. Runs batted in, and I tell you, Brian O'Connor really with high praise for his young first-year player. And Jackie said he has the most advanced approach for a 19-year-old that I've I've seen here at Virginia. What jumps out is that does not look like a freshman, right? 6'5", <laughs> 220, does not feel like an underclassman, but it's the approach, the discipline, the box. I, when you look at a freshman, it's not only got seven home runs, but how about 15 walks on the season? So he's like picking and choosing when to be really aggressive, which is so rare for someone so young. Hey, I think you know what you're talking about, how don't about you? How about that? Every once in a while, I surprise even <laughs> myself for those listening along sometimes. So a walk by Santucci, and he certainly doesn't want to get into that mix after the seven walks last week in the NC State game, and Probably the last, well, not probably, certainly the last thing he wanted to do after his teammates just got him two runs was to walk the leadoff batter. I don't want to understate enough as well the job by McKay. I mean, you still give up the two spot, a difference maker to be able to punch out then the side and limit the damage. Two, not bad, but four to six runs with Santucci on the mound might be insurmountable, so that's huge. Now, if you're Duke, it's all about winning the zero battle, right? Keeping old uncle momentum in your dugout, you have to be able to go throw up a zero against one of the better teams in the country now. As a lefty-lefty matchup here, the only one that Santucci will enjoy in the Cavalier lineup tonight as Coach O'Connor has stacked it with right-handed batters. Two balls and one strike on Didowick, batting at 353, leads him in homers with a dozen and RBIs with 40. And that's a good pitch to even it at two and two. And now the Blue Devils will shift their defense with three infielders on the right side. And that's right there for a called third strike. Didowick must have been looking for something else because that, that looked pretty center cut. Similar to Obi in that last set bat we saw in the bottom half of the inning. I, this fastball just darted, mm -hmm. right? So much intent that it almost as a hitter when you find yourself in those pitcher advantageous spots, a really well-executed fastball can at times just freeze you. It did there. Third strike already, third strike out already for Santucci, and now Jacob Ferentz handling the catching duties tonight for UVA. Runner goes, throw to second, skips into center field. Ford will be content with the base at second. 
think that was a little bit of a delayed steal, or he read that pitch really well when it hit the turf. No, it's delayed, right? So I thought sometimes so. with a lefty on the mound, you're taught to go on first movement. So look, it's just delay, delay. So it's a vault, vault, hold. And then you almost want to take it on a catcher who doesn't come out the shoot so well. Maybe a dirt ball read, but to me, it almost looks like to lay it out the jump. Throw that's rarely up the line, but if Morse is able to pick it cleanly, they probably get him. But great IQ base run in order to just steal 90 feet and, and more so get out of double play down. Third steal of the year for Ford, who's now in scoring position with one out. On the right side, can Morris get there? He does, makes the play to first. Ford will advance to third, but now two down in the Cavaliers' second. Something funny that just happened, too. I'm not sure if it happened on the vault from Logan Bravo, but everybody hold your breath. We're okay. The Oakley's all right. Bravo <laughs> loses the shades off of the top of his glasses as the sun's starting to set here at Jack Coombs Field. But to your point, the delayed steal, the, um, you know, the dirt ball read, all of a sudden that double play not in order. And the Cavs live to see another out. I saw that. I saw the glistening out of the corner of my eye. Like, what is that? I don't. In the world of NIL, I'm not sure if the Dukies have been hooked up with Oakley yet, but that, that could have been a, a really uncomfortable crunching sound. Maybe there's an opportunity now for Logan Bravo. Who knows? You're right in this day and age. That's into left center field, and that'll get the Cavaliers on the board. The RBI single for Henry Godbout, the UVA second baseman who came into the game with a 383 batting average. That's his 24th run batted in. Good piece of hitting. I mean, this ball's almost a ball and a half on the inside corner. Perfectly executed. Just a better job fighting to stay alive here. Godbelt does a great job of clearing the hands, gets the foot down early, just finds enough barrel to scratch across a run. Right, You don't have to get it all back at once. But I go back to the base running, right, to take that free 90 from Henry Ford that keeps that inning alive. And that's some of what Coach O'Connor was talking about that he is wise beyond his years for a freshman, a 19-year-old who's hitting the ball great, doesn't run a whole lot, but when he does, he's been successful, and it leads to a Cavalier run. Cuts the Duke lead in half to 2-1, to one, and now Ethan Anderson, the designated hitter tonight for UVA and batting out of the number eight spot for the Cavaliers. 314 hitter with a couple of homers and 16 driven in. And he looks at a strike. I love how you emphasize eighth spot. I did. Doesn't it feel unfair for Ethan Anderson to be hitting in your eighth spot? I think even Brian O'Connor kind of says that a little bit. <laughs> like, I've dropped him to eight. Can you believe I did that? That is a towering pop-up on the third base side, and it'll get out of play over the Duke dugout. And this is where, like, he was probably the most feared power hitter coming into the season, I think, from a preseason rankings uh, perspective. But, like, when you look at what he's doing, to me, I always look, take a look at that OBP at 413 OBP. But how about 16 walks to just 10 strikeouts? You invert that number at any year in your collegiate career is so impressive. Nevertheless, the bottom of half of your line. Mm -hmm. Struggled a little bit at the outset of the year. Brian O'Connor said, well, maybe he was pressing a little bit. Obviously, who he was replacing as a catcher. Maybe he was trying to do a little bit too much. So I dropped him down in the batting order, and it's paid dividends so far, right? All of a sudden, like, at this level, especially in the ACC, the scouting report is out on Ethan Anderson. There's no hiding him. But at times, like, if you're a pitcher, you can start to breathe a little bit when you can just, hey, maybe I can sneak in a fastball. There is no sneaking in fastballs against Mr. Ethan Anderson. 2-2 pitch. And he just got a piece of it to stay alive. Had two balls and two strikes. That's a great fight to just live to see another pitch. Mm -hmm. And if you're Santucci, those are, these are kind of those at-bats as you've seen the pitch count now start to climb to up over 38, just 17 in the first inning. That, hey, this is maybe an at-bat that, despite the outcome, prevents him from going seven innings instead of just six. Runner goes, throw to second, and out at second base is Godbout. A good throw that time from Alex Stone, and they catch God coaching win list behind only the guy who the stadium is named after. I was going to say, do we get like a practice facility named after Coach Paul? How does that work? He could probably pick and choose. 
And, you know, he has been, obviously, the guy who has spearheaded. They're getting set to do some major renovations here. And, obviously, the success he's had with this program has been hand-in-hand hand to start to get that done. Yeah, too, I think it was the gift or GIF, however you want to call it, over the summer when there was maybe some question marks about, does he go and take a bigger job? Or He was very intentional about the program that he's built here, a standard of excellence, that he wants the college baseball world to get familiar with the Duke brand. It's a blue-collar, really gritty group of guys. He goes and recruits those type of dudes. So when he sent out that gift that said, hey, we're breaking down the door, we're not done yet, he kind of fired up a spark in the entire ACC baseball community. Chase Cruson lost that one to left. Didowick close to the line is there to make the catch for the first out here in the bottom of the second. Well, five NCAAs, Super Regional, three of the last five years. School's first ever ACC championship a few years ago. That'll get your name on the door. Yeah, and absolutely <laughs> will. And, like, even when you see some of the, the transfer guys that they've brought in, like, they all fit the bill of how Coach Pollard wants to attack each and every day. And, and maybe none so clear than a guy like a Zach Morris or a Ben Miller at the top of the lineup. Not because of the success that they have, but the way that they interact with their teammates, that they hold them accountable, that there's that leadership aspect that he has kind of just built that it oozes around this entire facility. Blue Devils climb back to the top of the order already here in the bottom of the second. They sent eight men to the plate when they scored the deuce in the first inning. So... Zach Morris back in there. He got it all started, hit by a pitch, and scored a run in the first. Fouls that one off of the screen. Two balls and one strike, and you know Cullen McKay would love a 1-2-3 inning here. After he really had to work hard to get out of that first. That one down the right field line. Salky with a long run, but it's going to be unplayable. And the count holds at two balls and two strikes. And I think when you talk about turning this into a bullpen game, right, you see the pitch count up over 41. That plays right into the hands of Duke, who's got maybe the deepest bullpen in the country with three guys named and tabbed as All-American dudes going into the season. I, I think that if Duke is smart, right, like you saw Kirsten kind of getting excited about an early fastball, like you want to work counts, right? Like see five, six pitches in at bat, get to that Virginia bullpen early that, again, mentioned there's some injuries in that bullpen, so test some of those young arms. And Morris is on for the second time in as many innings, once hit by a pitch, and now with a one-out walk. Just the prototypical leadoff. Every once in a while I know what I'm talking about, but you can see, like, I, he never got that fastball in the inner part of the zone that he loves to feast on, so he just fights to see the next pitch, right? It, that's what makes offenses like this, and, and they've been tagged as a top five offense in baseball. Like, they're just so difficult to get out as well. I know that McKay's got three punch outs, but each guy goes up with a, a particular plan. Ben Miller's plan is just to hit everything really, really hard, which is in my mind, pretty good plan. But, mm -hmm. uh, this offense is so intentional about how they go about their work. That's what he did his first time up with the RBI double that scored Morris all the way from first base. So he's kind of looking for a rewind here and do it all over again. Miller with that hit in the first inning is now hit safely in seven in a row. 13 of his past 24. There's a pitcher's strike on the inside corner at the knees. Taking a look as they get to a one-two count. I'm, I'm curious with Morris over at first, he's got the six stolen bases. Is this, it's not a hit and run, obviously. Two strikes, a run and hit spot. Got him swinging, really handcuffed him. Brought him way inside on that one. And McKay already with his fourth strikeout. And two, how about the adjustment, right? Miller hit a breaking ball in his last at bat. They go change up. We talked about in the open how that breaking ball was going to be so important for him to execute. Now he's going to that change up here in the second time through the order. Maybe he doesn't have the bite that he's looking for with that off speed, but the change up nasty on that pitch just fell off the table. So now two outs for the Blue Devils here in the second, protecting the two to one lead. And here's A.J. Gracia who struck out swinging his first time up. Takes strike one, a fastball, thought about it, but didn't go at 94 miles an hour. Another of the Duke hitters who has been hot of late, has hit safely in nine of his past 11. 
with five multi-hit games. Runner is going. Throw is right there on the muddy. Terrific throw by Jacob Ferentz. And they catch Morris trying to steal to end the inning. So each catcher has gunned down a runner. It seems like they have become regulars in Omaha. Yeah, they. Uh, I, I think they just go ahead and book the Airbnb every February, just get ready for that flight out to Nebraska. But to your point, get to talk with them before the game. What is the encore? He said in the back half of his crease, I've just kind of relaxed and chilled out in a way that, like, I think my team has responded, right? I think the player takes on the embodiment of their leader, their head coach, and I think that's why you've seen this team come back and win games where they trailed by a few 14 times already this year. Anderson chops the ball to second. Zach Morris waits for the big hop and throws him out. And, you know, as Brian was saying to us before the game, in his younger days, he probably would have been ranting and raving and storming up and down the dugout if he had a team that fell behind in 18 of their 25 games. He doesn't really do that anymore. Yeah, and to your point, Richmond just on Tuesday, a leadoff grand slam will rattle teams. Not this team, not this program, who you mentioned has become a staple in Omaha, who just... Right, if the expectation is not only do we want to play in regionals and supers and get to Omaha, we want to host them. We want to build a program where fans are proud to be a Cavalier. And uh, even we joked with them, the, the new podcast they're doing, right? It's so genuine. It's so authentic. You feel like you can almost touch the fabric of Virginia baseball. He has become a uh, social media guru. It was really impressive and fun to listen to. This is a routine fly ball to right. Grassi will make the catch, two up and two down here in the third. And, of course, the other part of that story on Brian O'Connor is he's an Omaha native, and he played and pitched his college baseball at Creighton, where he pitched in the College World Series for Creighton. So can we elect him mayor of Omaha? Is that how that works? <laughs> well, I think it is his facial depiction on that, that monument, that statue that they have in Omaha when you walk into the ballpark that, there, The ever right? famous that made its way over from Rosenblatt. It's become yeah. a staple. Everyone takes the pictures. Well, just head up to Charlottesville. You can get a picture with the live in action. <laughs> of the live guy. Yeah. <laughs> Top of the order, Griffo Farrell raised the curtain on our game tonight with a line drive to left that Macon Winslow hauled in. So he is 0 for 1. And that's into shallow right field. The right fielder, Gracia, is there again. Loses his cap but catches the baseball and then tomorrow and Saturday. All right, Duke in the third inning with a two-to-one advantage. And Gracia was at the plate when Morris got gunned down stealing, so he'll start anew here. One ball, no strikes. And one and one. You know, we talk a lot, Jack, about the transfers for Duke, but these two freshmen have certainly made an early impression, haven't they? When you talk about the headliner of that group, it was Kyle Johnson, the two-way sensation. Not to say that these guys were afterthoughts, but A.J. Gracia, in his first collegiate start, a three-homer game. Macon Winslow, Coach Pollard told us, maybe one of the best defensive catchers he's seen, and he's 18 years old, yet the bat's been what's been so impressive in this freshman campaign. I think you can accredit it to a really solid, strong leadership council in that veteran group because it feels like the game's moving in slow motion for these freshmen. Mm -hmm. Or oftentimes, that's maybe the most difficult part is slowing it down, staying within yourself, understanding that you have the talent to excel at this level. But Grassi and Winslow were ready first pitch. Well, Grassi is a guy who was pretty much ready first game. Actually, it was his second game. I hate to bring this up to you because... He really did some damage to your George Mason Patriots. <laughs> Second game of his collegiate career. He goes four for five, three homers. And I'm not misspeaking here. Nine RBI. Nine. Three nine. homers. Is that pretty good first impression? <laughs> they say it makes it last. And I'll tell you, we didn't take it personal. I was on the call for that. Where are you? Everyone was like, it was like an Oprah Winfrey TV show. You get a homer and you get a homer. As this ball is going to trickle out of foul play, it looked like it was well out of play as it gets kind of lost in that Bermuda Triangle, the on-field bullpen. Tough play out and left from Didowick. Boy, that really is hard. That That's a little bit scary, too, because you could easily trip and fall and hurt something going over that pitching mound down there. And he's upset with himself. That's one of yeah. those plays where 
Hey, man, you make it. You make that play, and it, oh, it's routine, but you miss it, and you may feel a little foolish. That's a really tough play in foul ground. And they get him anyway as Gracia goes down swinging. I want to tell you a funny story about Gracia, though. I watch the swing, right? He takes advantage of a little bit of a two seam fastball, blows it by him. Colin McKay, who's got a really incredible spin rate on that heater, get to talk with Gracia after that three homer game. I go, hey, man. You have a, a Homer Selly guy inspiration because the swing looks just like a Carlos Gonzalez of the Colorado yeah. Rockies. He goes, who? And I go, <laughs> oh, man, I'm old. This is tough. <laughs> so that's the only offense I took to that story. <laughs> well, find a, find a first or second year major league guy <laughs> who will know about because it does look like it. I, I agree with you. But that's a big out there for McKay uh, to start the third inning. And now Bravo, who had the other RBI double back in the first One ball, one strike. McKay already up to five strikeouts. So, Jack, he's becoming a little bit of a strikeout pitcher with the 10 that he had last week against Pitt and five already tonight. There's that slider that he just hasn't really been able to find yet, but who cares who mates it when his fastball's got as much life as it has when you saw the last two-seamer to Gracia. That plays against righties or lefties in the box. towering pop-up behind the plate. There's not a lot of room back there, and it's up onto the roof. There you go. <laughs> I, well, you see there that, that fastball that gets in on the hands of Bravo. He hit a home run against NC State last week where it felt like it didn't get 10 feet up off the ground before it left the yard to dead right field. He's a guy that likes to get his hands extended, being a 6'5", 230-pound body. He got long arms, and that's a really well-executed in inside fastball to put him away. Boy, does McKay have that strikeout pitch going now. That is six strikeouts here in two and two-thirds innings. I mean, that is rising up. That's what I was show. just thinking. I'm I, like, is that an optical illusion, or did it really just rise? Seriously, up? I thought Mythbusters put that to rest. Are we cool with it? His stat track stuff is insane, but you're seeing it's a spin rate, whereas a hitter, it might only say 93, 94, and I'm, I'm hunting a spot, not necessarily a pitch. But again, because it's that illusion where it feels like it's getting on you, it feels more like 96, 97 than the number you're seeing at home. So back-to-back -back strikeouts. Actually, that's three in a row for McKay. He struck out Miller, the last actual batter that he retired in the second before the caught stealing. And now Gracia and Bravo to start the third. Stone's got the jump here. Two balls and no strikes. Singled his first time up. And he chased that one, and it's two and one. And you know what I'm, I'm really liking out of the Norfolk? Norfolk uh, native, he's pitching with some swagger. Mm -hmm. Like he's starting to feel himself a little bit. That first inning, I, I think he was upset with him trying, missing on those breaking balls that were hammered into left center field. He is pitching with some intense swagger right now where like every fastball is going exactly where he wanted, wants it to go. It's interesting you say that because when he struck out Gracia, I happened to notice him and he was kind of stomping around the mound. You know, he came down the front slope onto the, onto the green turf and kind of stomped around the mound. I think he really liked that strikeout of a really good hitter. Now a ground ball to third. Hanson's going to be a tough play, and he makes it. <laughs> really nice play by Luke Hanson. He kind of had to battle the third base bag. Blue yearn counts often. I know that might be trivial to sound, but to me, like, the velo drops a little bit, but he's staying within himself. He's a big, strong kid. But watch how he gets downhill. It's almost like he's reaching into the chest of Stone. Two, three, four hitters challenging Sanducci here in the fourth. Bobby Whalen with a count of one ball, one strike. He struck out swinging his first time up. Behind in the count, one and two. Whalen, the Indiana transfer. Santucci. Good pitch there, right in on the hands, and it stays a ball and two strikes. Look how effortless it looks for him right now. I think that's kind of maybe what I meant an inning ago, where he's staying within himself. He's not trying to do too much. He's got that precision pinpoint accuracy, almost like Hawkeye from Marvel or something like that. He's just locked in. Two and two now. Bobby Whalen started the game for Virginia at 4-10. Just got a piece of that one. Talked with Coach O'Connor before the game. 
just kept saying tough. It's like he, he like couldn't help himself. Like this kid just oozes toughness, and you'll see in these at bats, it's really wide and you choke up a little bit, and he's just a tough out. And he said he just gets hits. He just gets hits. Not this time up though, as he chases one in the turf. And a little bit of housekeeping work there as Alex Stone throws on to Bravo to complete the strikeout and one down here in the fourth. You can see, watch this back foot action. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a big league slider, right? Like it's big league slider stuff. And when he eventually plays at the next level, I mean, he's a two pitch guy mix at the collegiate level, right? Fastball slider, but he gets away with it because he splits the plate better than anybody in the country with that big arm side run fastball and a slider. That, that pitch started in the left-handed batter's box, it felt like, before it ended up on the back foot of Whalen. One down for Casey Salky, one strike. And now one and one, he struck out swinging in the top half of the first inning. Salky, one of the mainstays on this Cavalier team. Rips it into left field for a base hit between Miller and Clark. Second hit of the evening for Virginia and the tying run at first with one out. This is such a good piece of hitting from Salky. It's, it's one of his hardest sliders he's thrown yet, up to 90 miles per hour, which tells you what. There's not as much break, but it's hard. It's almost like a, a, a hard cutter that tries to get in on the hands. It almost looks like he's sitting not only on that slider, but just on a spot on the inner half. He wasn't going to get beat, and he didn't. Now a seven-game hitting streak for him as he leads from first with the cleanup batter Ford at the plate. He walked, stole a base, and scored the Cavaliers' run in the second inning. And he's ahead here, 2-0, which could make it dangerous. Kind of interesting, Jack. You can see the sunshine. There's a great shot of it right there at home plate. Everything else kind of in the shade, in the shadows. Just wonder how tough that is for patter batters to pick up the ball. I'll tell you this, Santucci doesn't need any more advantages <laughs> right. on the mound as possible, so you're right. It might be squinting a little bit, but... It's just that little sliver right out in front of the plate, right? I'll tell you, it's much more terrifying when you almost see, like, the pitcher in a shadow and then it, the ball comes in and out mm -hmm. of the sun. So maybe from a perspective like, hey, when, if you're looking in for signs from the dugout. But I think at this point in time of the day, you saw hockey, hey, no worries, I'm good. Going to ambush the <laughs> yeah, six. He didn't have any problem with it, right? 2-2 <laughs> right. yep. to Ford. Full count now. There's the slider that I actually asked Coach Pollard about. Seven walks last week to NC State in the Friday matchup against the rival Wolfpack. It was that slider he walked four hitters on up in the zone, arm side. Look for that adjustment throughout the at bat. Boy, that's a nasty pitch there on three and two. And he strikes out Ford. Wow. There's the adjustment, right? There's the slider that he misses up in the zone, arm side. Watch this break. And again, for a strike too, right? So I got to stay within the zone against a really disciplined freshman and just throws a dart. That's a, hey, welcome to ACC baseball, Mr. Henry Ford. <laughs> Two down for Harrison Didowick, who takes a strike. He looked at a called third strike his first time up. And he's kind of staring into what's left of that sun sign. You can see it, like, glistening off of his face. Oh, a wild one to the backstop. That will get Salky into scoring position at second base. To your point about the sun, maybe this is because this is the first time we've seen a lefty having to deal with it. You can tell it may be paying more of an impact, but let's see if another free 90 for UVA. We know he stole a run in the top of the second on that dirt ball, the late steal read. Let's see if they can't steal another with two outs. Swung through that one. Didowick with the very impressive power numbers and run production numbers. And that just missed outside. And Coach O'Connor was talking about him before the game, about you know how, how much he's come of age from his freshman season last year to his sophomore season this year. 
Right. I think there's so many conversations about the transfers and how that impacts your locker room and club. How about the youngsters that are, are not only delivering, but delivering right away? There's still that developmental piece that you can tell is still a lot of these head coaches' favorite part about their job. And that's another good take and a walk for Didowick. That was a pretty impressive at bat. A couple of borderline pitches. And that will force Santucci to throw more pitches here in the fourth inning. Already up to 72, something that he's mm -hmm. been trying to work on. We mentioned that eight pitch inning just a half ago, but that's a lefty, right? Like that's his guy. This is bread and butter, and he misses on those sliders away. But kudos to the youngster for not chasing. So two on, two outs. Big situation here in the top half of the fourth inning with Duke clinging to a two to one lead. Jacob Ferentz swings through the first pitch. A clutch opportunity for Ferentz, who's working on a 10-game hitting streak. He grounded to second his first time up. Rifles that one foul, back of third. And Santucci with the jump at 0-2. Blink of an eye, right? And if you're fair, it's just making a 16th start of the season as a kid that had to come in and really earn his time. Like, they felt good about what they had behind the plate, but the power number's evident. But how about, to hit 491 at this point in the season, I don't care how many at-bats you have, is unheard of. Behind here, 0-2. And in the dirt, runners thought about it, but hang on. Well, Ferentz really is a remarkable story. The D3 transfer from Salisbury, which is one of the best Division III programs in the country. In fact, Ferentz won a national championship while he was there. But still, that's quite a jump from Division III to a powerhouse Division I. That's a little humpback line drive. It's going to be tough. Let's see. Nice play by Bravo to go to second to Clark. They'll get the force on Didowick. That was going to be the only play they had. No. McKay going to work already with six punch outs. And McKay now back to work here in the bottom half of the fourth inning. You mentioned that pitcher's duel. It didn't feel like in the top half of the no, inning. You see the numbers have kind of evened out. The comparison between the two of them, not much to choose from as they have settled in as we hit the middle innings tonight. Wallace Clark at the plate ahead in the count 2-0, and and he walked his first time up. And that's the only walk that McKay has allowed, but now he's behind three balls and no strikes. Clark then Winslow and Obi for Duke. In the bottom half of the fourth inning. And a four-pitch walk for Wallace Clark. Well, that's an at-bat that McKay's going to wish he had back. We, we talked about his ability to get ahead in counts. That's kind of polar opposite as it's four straight to Wallace Clark, who, who might flash the leather as good as anybody at that short. Yep. Get a ball on the ground on the back side and get the defense moving a little bit. Well, that's over the top of his head. He wasn't going to do anything with that. Yeah, I, I like your idea. Make him, make him zero in, right? He's got to put the bat on the ball. And not exactly a guy you would, would call upon to bunt and at the bottom of the lineup. And that one, I think, hit him on the hand. This is a double spot, though, as it looks like they are going to send him down to first. It looks like it glances off of leave the bottom. Hey, we'll get a better look here. Ooh, that's a double yeah. spot, too, where it just absolutely smokes fairs behind the plate as well. And the Cavaliers did ask for an appeal at first, but Travis Carlson, the first place umpire, did say no swing. So it will be a hit by pitch. Command issues here in the bottom of the force for McKay as Winslow looks like he's going to be all right and head down to first. And to your point, right, struggling a little bit. Sometimes a hit by pitch. It just, I want to find a way to get down. To get the on first base, base, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's a youngster that they have to have in the lineup, so it's good to see him shake it off. So now two on, nobody out on a walk and a hit batter, the second hit batter of the game by McKay. 
And here's Devin Obey, who struck out his first time up. And that's on the inside corner for a strike. That's your point, Bob. Now, this is a guy mm-hmm. I could see putting a button down. Mm-hmm. First, second, nobody out. Catapult technology, nerd out at home. This is one of the fastest kids in the country. Right. Registered up to 21 miles per hour. And he rips that one into left field for a base hit. Coming around third and heading home is Clark, and he will score. He ran right through the stop sign of third base coach Ty Blankmeyer, and with a headlong dive, he's in to give Duke a 3-1 to one lead. He did. He busted right through the stop sign at third. Still nobody out. You wanted to blow through it. I'm thinking, hey, I got to get a bunt down. Obi's got, hey, man, I'm hitting 367 on the year. Let me swing the bat. He drives in what is already his 19th RBI in the eight hole, and Duke gets another run back. (laughs) If the uh, police are in attendance, they're going to ticket him for running through a stop sign. I can tell you that. (laughs) There's a reason you're the best in the business. That's an all-time line. I've never heard that's good. (laughs) Never used that one before either. I think you inspired me. It was good. It was well done. Very well said. And it's still first and second and still nobody out. And now Chase Cruson at the plate. Taking high for ball one. So the the free passes, the free tickets here in the fourth have certainly come back to to haunt the Cavaliers. Well, doesn't that kind of tell you the difference between good and great teams is the great take advantage of mistakes. We, there were conversations had about leaving runners on, especially in that Clemson series. And even a weekend ago against NC State, you have to take advantage, especially early in counts. First, second, nobody out. If you're cruising again, I have to get a job done, advance these runners, and find a way to throw up a crooked number here in the fourth. Well, he may not have to do anything at the moment because McKay has lost the strike zone. Now 3-0, and and you would think this is a certain take situation here? No doubt. <laughs> right. I ask with a question mark. There you go. You bat on the but ground. But I think so, me. right? Starting to get some stirring in the Virginia bullpen. And indeed, it is a take, and it's low for ball four. And the Blue Devils now have the bases loaded with nobody out and the top of the order coming up. And, and to no offense to Cruson, right, a youngster that's hitting 345 in just his eighth start of the season. Guy's got crazy power, but this is a situation where we talked about wanting to dive into that Virginia bullpen. Like, that was more so a, I want to see pitches work counts and force the hand of the Virginia pitching coach. That fastball on both sides of the plate, but he's worked himself into a problem where now it's the top of the lineup versus in that first, it was the bottom half. So here's Zach Morris with the bases loaded and nobody out. First pitch strike. Uh, Drew Dickinson, the pitching coach for Virginia. Didn't want anybody trading uniforms middle of the game, but I mentioned Coach Kirkpatrick, who, of course, is Duke's pitching coach. Morris fouls it straight back. He had a good rip there. It's a breaking ball that just backs up on him, but can't. Like a, like a good basketball player, the shooter, good misses just off the back iron, similar in the box. You see a guy that will pitch straight back, it means they're right on it. Morris fights that one off. Uh, you can use all the basketball analogies you want here at Duke and Fair. in Durham this weekend with both the men <laughs> and the women in the Sweet 16. So there basketball analogies are well-placed. One well, ball, two strikes. It is March Madness, but we're baseball, guys. We tell March Madness to, <laughs> hey, bug off until you get to the final four. We'll, we'll care then. But it's all about the diamond here this this weekend. I think those Duke basketball fans, they need to make their way out to Jack Coombs because there's something special brewing here in Durham. Count holds at one ball and two strikes. Well, this has the feel of a postseason game and series. So this is our own kind of baseball March Madness. I know... Kevin O'Connor was talking about, you know, we're going to reach the halfway point. For them, they will at the end of this weekend series. And he went around. The appeal to Travis Carlson, the first base umpire, and a dismayed Zach Morris didn't necessarily agree with it. Do you? Oh, yeah, no doubt, right? Mm-hmm. Great call from the first base umpire. And that's the best breaking ball he threw in that bat. bat. You, you saw a couple that had missed up in the zone, and Morris had fouled straight back. Again, the kids stepped up in huge spots with runners on. Kenny Strand, another with maybe the most dangerous bat in all of the ACC. That's Ben Miller. Who takes a first pitch strike. Doubled, knocked in a run in the first, struck out in the second. Came into the game third in the ACC in batting average. 
One ball, one strike. Winslow is the runner at third. Obi is at second. Cruson is at first. A run in and one down here in the home fourth. Two balls and a strike. Here's a hitter's paradise, right? This is exactly why you have a Ben Miller hitting your tool. He can be a table setter. He's clearly a guy that drives runners in with 27 RBIs on the season. This is exactly why you have him in this spot. Now watch him go ambush a fastball if it leaks out over the plate. Into left field, charging is Didawick. He'll have to play it on a bounce. Everybody will move up a base. Winslow will score. And the Blue Devils now with a 4-1 to one lead. Well, it's a breaking ball that backs up in the zone and, and frankly fools Ben Miller. Watch, he gets the foot down early, but watch his hands stay stacked on the backside. Not the hardest hit books by far, not even today for Ben Miller, but it gets the job done and it's because good hitters, right? If you're teaching a kid at home, this is clinical. I can sit on a pitch and miss and still find a way to be productive because those hands stay stacked on the backside and he's able to drive the ball into left field. Really productive at bat. And now Gracia with the bases loaded and one out. And he's looking to put something in play. He has struck out both times up. And now he's ahead. Two balls and no strikes. He could be jumping out of his cleats here, couldn't he? Yeah. <laughs> well, two, oh, you almost are. Is it a take for a strike spot? Ooh. Not in the heart of your line. I don't think so. No. Nope. Right? No, nope, I'm green lighting them here. Now well, we'll never know because he had to dance <laughs> yeah. out of the way of that. Now what are you doing, three and oh? I, I still, the pitch clock, right? That pitch count's rising. This is when it becomes chess, not checkers for these two youngsters that are battling it out. In the three hole, you give them enough confidence to let it rip, but to me, it's still a take first strike. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he was. Three balls and one strike. That is some of the beauty of baseball, that we get to do that, right? And I think everybody at home was playing along with us. I, I, I got to tell you, it's why I love my chair up here so much more than being in the spikes down there. It's so easy to overthink in that spot, but not for the young freshie. And that just missed. Inside for ball four. That's a good take. Gracia will be rewarded with a run batted in on the bases loaded walk. For fans at home, you might think I'm crazy. It's an active take, right? You see the hands still stay engaged. There's a lot of young hitters that are like, all right, I'm coming out of my shoes. And that Patriot League championship, big fastball, big slider, big kid, 6'6", 235. Where do they build freshmen like that after <laughs> anymore? And in his sophomore year campaign in the ACC, he could be like that middle relief pitch or a setup guy in the back end because of its experience pitching in big time moments. He's a really valuable arm that they need to get going here in ACC play. Well, this is a big time moment in a big ACC game and he enters with the bases loaded and one out and Logan Bravo wasn't waiting around to see what he's got. He went right after him and fouled it down the left field line. So the three runners on base, obviously McKay's responsibility with one out, three runs in here in the fourth. Into center field, Whalen to his left to the glove side makes the catch. Runner tags at third, will come in and score to make it a 6-1 advantage for the Blue Devils. And you can tell this is a bowling ball sinker of a fastball. It looks like actually UVA is going to go ahead and appeal the call at third. It will not stand, as they say, left in plenty of time as we got a great view from our awesome camera crew here at Jack Coombs Field. But you can see, and I'm glad that we get that look right there. He's a pre-grip changeup guy, so when he digs into his glove, he's holding the changeup. And he's a big guy, so when I say split the plate, right, for, for a viewer at home that's digging in the box, it's going to be something that runs in on the hands of a righty and then something that runs away from him. So a sinker slider mix, similar that we've talked about with Santucci, and this slider is going to get a really talented stone off balance. Well, that's a really good job by Osinski, isn't it? He comes in, he throws two pitches, and he gets two outs. The one run scores on the sacrifice fly, but he does a really nice job of runs. He threw a lot of pitches, right? He had five walks, six strikeouts, hit a couple of the batters, threw 94 pitches. It was that third time through the line yeah. that seemed to trip him up, but maybe to his own dismay, getting ahead early. Those four pitch walks killed him that inning. But great work by Osinski where if Virginia can get back in the game, highlight that moment, mm -hmm. just two pitches. And it felt like Duke worked himself into a frenzy. They were excited with runners on, trying to do some damage. And only to 
scratch across one run there feels like a big win for UVA. Yep. So they're down five as we go to the fifth. Bottom third of the order here for the Cavaliers. God Bouton, Anderson, and Hanson. And you know what's in Jonathan Santucci's mind. He needs a shutdown inning. And he gets the leadoff batter. God about gone. One down here in the fifth. I mean, that is filthy. I mean, it's you so grunted filthy. at that one. <laughs> I did. It almost took my breath. Maybe a little PTSD from being in a box and seeing a breaking ball like this where I felt the swing and miss upstairs. But God about absolutely laced on the left field his last at bat. Santucci is able to deliver a sword here already to start off the inning. Now the ever dangerous Ethan Anderson who grounded to second his first time up. And Santucci with the little bit of the luxury here with a big lead against a powerful potent offense. Anderson in fact working on a 14 game hitting streak. Batting out of the number eight spot. Just insane. I, I mean, we talked with Coach O'Connor too. Like two, three guys on the bench that we will see this weekend that are going to hit over 300 as well. And when you see what Anderson did the season ago, that OPS over 1,000, the home run numbers down a little bit. I, I expect them to get going, though, right? Mm -hmm. I think you put a lot of pressure on yourself when you're expected to be the guy this year. Well, they've got plenty of guys littered throughout this lineup that should alleviate a lot of pressure around the really talented Ethan Anderson. And we will see him not only at the plate, but behind the, week, the plate as this weekend moves along. Payoff pitch. And that bounces up there for ball four. And that's another streak that Anderson has going. That's now 26 straight games in which he's found his way on base. And a big just find a way to put a little bit of mileage on Santucci. You see that pitch count at 87. It felt like after that first at bat strikeout that if he could keep it under 90 to 95 pitches, yes, they want him to record a decision by getting through five, but with as many arms as they have stocked up in that bullpen, to get through six and save, you know, maybe a Bielinson to only have to go an inning or mm -hmm. an O'Shanta to only have to go an inning or found town. Getting through five and six is such a game changer, especially on Thursday when you can set up the rest of the weekend. Luke Hansen batting out of the number nine spot. One ball, one strike. He flied to right his first time up. With one out. And now two balls and one strike. So I mentioned Anderson. 26 consecutive games on base, so that's every game they've played this year. This is game number 26 for them. Yeah, it, it, a youngster, right, being just a sophomore in what feels like a, an upper-class ridden team. He's a kid that appeared in 26 games a season ago. Pinched hit a ton. 16 for 45, so not a ton of volume, but hit 356. But they expected this type of production for him. He was a stud athlete in high school. He was a really highly recruited kid. Won a state championship in baseball. Oh, and by the way, football. So if you were thinking maybe a little sunshine with the sweet flow, you'd be spot on as well. <laughs> and that misses low for ball four. So back to back walks here by Santucci with one out. is quickly through the minor leagues. If he stays in the zone, nobody can hit him. There was no hit last week. And today he's been really tough to barrel up. But, you know, if if I'm an opposing offense and I'm game planning against him, I, I'm almost to take a strike and he's got to throw something early in the zone before I even take the bat off the shoulder. And now one of the best hitters in Virginia history and I'm not really embellishing that, is coming to the plate. It's something that, that Brian O'Connor was marveling about in talking with us. You know, he said, this, this young man has the single season hit record at Virginia. And oh, by the way, we've had some pretty good hitters here at UVA. You won a national championship within the last decade, but what stood out to you on that graphic? 
How about three of them were on the same team? Oh, on the same year? team, right. A right. deal yeah. right there. Ethan Anderson, just 10 behind, or 11 yep. behind, excuse me. But that was all in the same lineup in Omaha a year ago. <laughs> That's why they were in Omaha a year ago. <laughs> And Santucci has kind of lost it here. I would think if he doesn't get O'Farrell, we will get that pitching change with the, the meat of the order coming up. O'Farrell taking all the way, and it's three balls and one strike, and Santucci's right at about the same pitch mark that McKay was when he came out of the game in the last inning. Infield back with runners at second and third. To third base. And Miller thought about coming home. He might have had a play there, but he'll take the out at first. Now a four-run advantage. That plays right in front of Ben Miller, and I think because you have the five-run lead, Santucci who wants to get through five. I mean, watch where this, I mean, this is right in front of him. A, a perfect throw here at the plate with Stone, and he's dead to rights. With that being said, you allow yourself to, hey, let's go hunting out. Allow yourself to work out of this inning. You sacrifice the run for the out, but to me, it felt like if he comes and plays through that baseball and makes the throw on the run, it's not even going to be close with Anderson at the plate. Bobby Whalen swings and misses nothing in one, so the Cavaliers get the run to make it a 6-2 game, and that was certainly in Miller's mind. He's like, let's just get outs here, and it's still a four-run lead. Virginia will now slow the game down a little bit with a, a hitter and third base coach conversation where I think this is just to try to take Santucci out of rhythm, right? Like, let's slow the game down a little bit, give that Duke bullpen an opportunity to go, hey, are you sure you don't want to go to the pen? <laughs> We're done seeing this stuff. Well, Kevin McMullen's been doing it a long time in that third base coaching box that has been with Brian O'Connor forever here at, at UVA. This will be pitch number 100 for Jonathan Santucci, and he's had some time to think about it. And this would be a big out for him. As you said, Jack, this will get him through five with a lead. And he should get it. Devin Obi coming in just a couple of steps in straightaway center, makes the catch, and that's a nice job by Jonathan Santucci. Time-wise, they did want to stay on the Thursday, Friday, Saturday schedule, but we could have been looking at about an 8 o'clock start tonight if the rain had persisted, and fortunately it didn't. It's a beautiful night. Mother Nature, as you beautifully said in the open, it was on the same page as we were. Yes. If college game day for college baseball, which I know the guys at 11.7 want to bring to life, <laughs> this would be the weekend where you'd want to be. And so Mother Nature said, yeah, let's let's go ahead. Let us play a little bit as we get a top 10-ish matchup with 9 and 11 Virginia and Duke as we got a beautiful sunset here at Jack Coombs Field. We never did figure out how to frame the matchup today. White, we both wanted to say top 10 matchup. <laughs> no. And that would not be accurate. That one is into center field past the sliding Griff O'Farrell, and it's a leadoff single for Wallace Clark, who's on base for the third time in the game. He immediately jumps in that left-handed batter's box, and uh, to me, he just feels like he is, there's a lot more fluidity in the swing as he just does a great job of staying through the middle of the field, shooting it up the middle. We saw two sacrifice flies against Sam Highfill against NC State, where it drove the left fielder all the way back to the wall. Maybe not the biggest guy, but he's got some really sneaky backside pop at that shortstop spot. That one gets away from Ference. Great jump by Clark, and he will waltz into second base. Imagine that'll be a wild pitch. And I'll tell you what, the bottom of this order for Duke tonight has really done a great job. I mean, Clark's been on base three times, Winslow once, Obi once, Cruson once. They have really set the table for the top of the order. One ball, one strike. Winslow has struck out and been hit by a pitch. But now the Blue Devils are in a position to get that run back that the Cavaliers got in the top of this inning. A little bit outside. I'll tell you, too, that you, know, you get a two spot in the bottom half of the first and a four spot there. And, and for Virginia, we've talked about it. We don't want to overstate it. The cardiac Cavs, 
they've played from behind all year. So to just get runs back and to just scratch a little bit, you don't have to get it all back at once, is huge for that offense as they have now what we would allude to potentially Duke having to go to the pen uh -huh. the next inning with uh, Santucci now over 100 pitches. They're like, hey, let's just stick around. Let's work at bats, get into that pen early. That is a very vaunted Duke bullpen, by the way. Mm -hmm. But let's take another shot at that pen and just keep it within striking distance. Three and one on Winslow, and he bounces that one to the shortstop O'Farrell. He'll make the play to first, but it'll be in a productive at bat and an out as Winslow with the ground out advances Clark to third with one away. And two in that spot, if you're Winslow, you're just trying to hit a ball on the ground to the right side to advance the runner in that position. Since he gets him to roll over, but again, great base running mm -hmm. from Wallace Clark where you're taught, hey, vault, vault. And then if that ball's anywhere behind your at you, it's a judgment read. Well, he reads right and steals in, takes a f another free 90 now. It's just 90 away from, as you mentioned, getting that run back. And it forces the Cavaliers to bring their infield up on Devin Obi here, who already has an RBI base hit. Good look at the Cavalier infield ringing the green turf with the runner at third, Clark, and one out. And that is a fair ball wedged inside the left field line. That'll score the run, and Obi is on his way to second. The ball gets away, and he'll make his way to third. <laughs> a little league triple short. <laughs> the stand-up double from Obi. He gets a breaking ball that hangs on the inside corner. He's a pull side hitter. He's a quick twitch athlete. And watch him get back to this. I misspoke. That looks like almost like a changeup that doesn't back up too much. And just outside the outreach glove of Luke Hansen, and Obi does it yet again. Just find a way to put a ball in play with less than two, force the defense to make a play. And now UVA is going to be forced to keep their infield in. Yep, that's his second run batted in tonight for Devin Obi, who's now up to 20 on the season. And they do get that run back and have an opportunity to get another one here with Obi at third on the error after the double. And so Duke looking to keep piling on. This is a perfect that bat from Chase Kirsten. You, you saw him with his hand kind of mimic that little change up motion. He just misses and is a little out in front, but everything's going to leak into the barrel of Kirsten. As you see, there's another change up trying to get him out and he's out on his toes. But if Kirsten can get something and get the bat head out in front, Steal another run. Yep, ball and a strike here with just one out. A little bit high, two and one. And I would still go back to the base running of Wallace Clark, right? You mentioned that as well. That's about a, as perfect a trip around the bases as you could possibly have. He gets the base hit up the middle. Good break on the ball in the dirt, so he takes second. Good break on the ground ball behind him. Gets him to third, and even on the base hit by Obi, you saw it on our replay, Jack. He was actually diving back into the bag because the third baseman potentially could have fielded that ground ball and obviously could pick himself up and, and walk home once it got down the left field line. And that judgment play advancing from second to third, mm -hmm. right? Luke Hansen on that third baseline is probably playing close to the line and no doubles D if he isn't standing on third base. That one is hit deep to right field. Salky in front of the track will make the catch, but it'll be plenty deep enough for Obi to come down the line and score. This is very good fundamental baseball by the Duke Blue Devils, isn't it? Move runners, move runners, do a job. Doesn't matter where you are in the lineup. But I knew that this matchup boded well for Chase Krusen, as you can tell. If that's a fastball, I'm telling you, it might clear the scoreboard <laughs> here at Jack Coombsville. It's a nice changeup that catches off the end of the bat, but you can see with that high finish to me for college baseball fans, Krusen, the swing comp to me is just like Hurston Kerstep, the old Arkansas Razorback who broke camp with the Baltimore Orioles. It's a really nice, beautiful high finish. You can see it on that sacrifice fly and uh, hitting in the nine hole, making just his eighth start of the year. Kerstin, a really bright future here in Durham. So two outs with two runs in in the bottom half of the fifth inning. Morris, a little turf hugger to second. God bouts, got it. Will make the throw to first. A bit of a rougher start. He's looking to return to form. And you can see it's an uncomfortable at bat for lefties, for righties, for anybody looking to dig in. Where he's gotten himself in trouble is that strikeout to walk ratio. Similar to Santucci tonight and last week against NC State. Went in the zone. Talon unhittable, just needs to be in the zone. He was on that one. A ball and a strike on Casey Salky. Okay. 
Talon in relief of Jonathan Santucci, who certainly gave Chris Pollard what he wanted. Five innings, Santucci just two hits, a couple of runs. He did walk four, struck out six. Out away, two balls, two strikes. And fouled away again. It's really kind of a whiplash delivery. It is, isn't I know, it? I know it only says 91, but when in the box, because he comes from that three-quarter arm, so it, it feels like it gets you on you a lot harder than it actually is. You see these late fastballs spreading over the UVA first base dugout. It, it really is, when you, when you talk about whippy, that's exactly what it feels like. And you can dive into you know, the vertical and horizontal measurements and depth. It's a ton of arm side run for Townswell. Glad you mentioned that arm slot. I had an interesting conversation the other day with the former head coach at Davidson College, okay. Dick Cook, who coached Duke head coach Chris Pollard. There's a line drive right at the second baseman, Zach Morris. And I have known Coach Cook for a long time, and I asked him to give me a little dirt on Chris Pollard. <laughs> there you go. And he said, well, look, he came to us as a kind of stocky, okay freshman pitcher. And after his freshman year, we changed his arm slot, and we moved him to a funky kind of sidearm delivery, almost maybe a mirror image of what we're describing with Talon on the mound. And it was cool watching you and kudos to you and Coach Cook for watching you interact with Coach Pollard before the game, letting him know that story. He goes, all kidding aside, it changed my baseball career. It changed the outlook of how I attacked each day in and out. And those, you say funky, but it, it's, it is uncomfortable as a hitter. Those type of roll arms out of your bullpen become so valuable, especially in the back end of a season. Mm -hmm. Henry Ford, the batter now, takes that pitch at the knees for a strike, and it's one and two. I was just glad coach Pollard confirmed the story that I got <laughs> from Dick Cook and he said absolutely and he became a really good pitcher for Davids and that's a really good pitch by Talon and a called third strike on Henry Ford just kind of freezes him up fools him right you're sitting on that big loopy slider if you're Henry Ford and just dart right right on the back hip it's a perfect pitcher's pitch and this is where being a young freshman like Henry Ford when we talked about A.J. Grasse in that Duke dugout like, when you get into the depth of ACC play like how do you as a young hitter respond when that scouting report comes out on you? it's all fine dandy when you're just up there ambushing pitches early in counts but when you get deep in counts and they start to dissect the swing and the analytics behind it, um, obviously something said that that big talent fastball is going to play against anybody. Nevertheless, they're really talented Henry Ford. And now what do you do if you're Harrison Didowick going up against oh. this left-hander? He's done all right so far. He's got a hitter's count. And now two balls and one strike. I'll tell you, as a lefty, when you mentioned whiplash, it feels almost like it's being thrown behind you. <laughs> Not a good feeling. <laughs> no. <laughs> two balls and two strikes. So Talon looking to come in here and slam the door shut in his first inning. That's fouled straight back. We'll try it again at two balls and two strikes. That's also a really good piece of hitting to stay alive there, right? Like that fastball up in the zone looks like a beach ball, but so difficult to get on top of. So to be able to just touch, hang around, see another pitch, really well done by Didowick. And he rifles that one short hop by Bravo at first base, and he'll make the run to the bag. Boy, did Didowick crease the two, three, and four hitters. The first of which is Ben Miller, who swings through that first pitch. Deal, who actually leaves this Cavalier team with four saves on the season. As you dive into the numbers, the strikeout to walks when he's gotten in trouble, he's walking the yard a bit, but he's got electric stuff. Just missed outside, pitched an inning in the Tuesday game against Richmond, gave up a hit and a walk, and back out here on Thursday night. A little different for these guys, right? Do you think it throws them off at all playing a Thursday, Friday 
Saturday series instead of the usual Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or not really? I would say that it really only throws off maybe a guy like Jonathan Santucci who goes from having, you know, your full week's rest versus just going to five days rest. Um, outside of that, from a hitting standpoint, you really enjoy it, right? Like mm -hmm. a guy like Ben Miller who's red hot. You, you like to get in the box as much as you can when that ball looks as big as it does. Better than practice, right? No <laughs> doubt. And that was so interesting about some of these young freshmen that have come into Durham and hit as well as they have. A guy like A.J. Grasso, Coach Pollard, told us, hey, this guy like, from day one was hitting well. He put on the weight, and then all of a sudden he started lifting baseballs, and you see the power numbers. But how would you feel in the inner squads having to face this bullpen, <laughs> right? These starters, like a welcome to college baseball. Sure, those scrimmages must feel terrifying having to see talent four or five times, you know, in a month span. Full count pitch coming here to Ben Miller. He rips it foul down the left field line. Miller's had a good night. He's two for three with a couple of runs batted in and a run scored. Try it again at three and two. Teal to Miller. We'll try it one more time. Teal, as you can see, it's a little bit of a shorter arm action. Fastball up to 92, 93, the two-way sensation. If the last name sounds familiar, <laughs> probably should, but making his own name in his own right. Just an absolute stud, missed all of last year to an injury. What a battle he's got going here with Ben Miller. Love how there's no cave for him, you know what I mean? Like just attacking fastballs, just challenging them on both sides of the plate in this at bat. Good look at the two combatants. One more time on three and two. Eighth pitch of the at bat. How about a ninth? Yep, we will have a ninth pitch. <laughs> I was going to say, you go blind a little bit as there's a little bit of territory behind that dugout. Ben Miller and all Duke fans holding their breath a bit, but does this that pat not just sum up Ben Miller in a mm -hmm. nutshell? Mm -hmm. How do you get him out? He can beat you backside. He's already beat you pull side. He's got extreme power, but at the end of the day, too, just doesn't strike out either. Yeah. What'd you say? How about that? <laughs> Aiden Teal said, I hear you. I raise you up in the zone and challenge you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get them all right, Jack. Come on, with a two-seam fastball like that, how could I have guessed otherwise? So Teal starts his outing impressively enough with the strikeout, and now A.J. Gracia will bat. He has not put the ball in play yet tonight, and yet he does have a run batted in. He has struck out twice and walked with the bases loaded. Down the left field line, Didowick coming over, has a play on the ball just in fair territory and makes the catch for the second out of the inning. A nice play out and left by Didwick. I know it's routine, but this is that time of the night where it's twilight, right? It's not completely dark. A ball that gets up above those really romantic trees out in the outfield here at Coombs Field. All of a sudden, you start to lose it. You quiet the feet if you're an outfielder, and you're just hoping and waiting and praying that it comes back on underneath the lights. You were an outfielder, right? I, that I was. Did you use those cards? Back, oh, we back in your day, way back in your day, Jack. <laughs> in, in those pre-COVID college baseball days, I'd tell you, yes, we did at George Mason from a uh, like a pitch plan routine. Um, it's been really interesting to watch how they've implemented um, the pitch com stuff and how like certain guys on the field can utilize it and then they relay it and they move and shift based on you know every pitch thrown. Uh, what I tell you this, though, you know, being in the ACC, there's a lot more volume. Coach Pollard and I come in. Well, I guess the Davidson was in the SoCon at the time, coming mm -hmm. from the A-10. You don't really know. You can say I want to throw an outside fastball, but how many guys can actually execute it at that, at that level? So, um, I think yes, they can we, at this level, though. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like that a pitch. nasty sweeping slider. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, we, we used it. I think it was really helpful, too, um, when you talk about positioning gap to gap for a lot of different guys that spread the ball all over the field. One ball, two strikes here on Bravo with two outs and no one on. And Aiden Teal entices a pop-up. A lot of room over there on that side of the field, but not enough for either Henry Ford or Jacob Ferentz to make the catch. As you can see, decent amount of foul territory up and down the lines, not so much behind home plate. I hope 
people in this inning. And when you talk about the ERA being up over nine for two, 11 runs came in two outings for him. He's been nasty, and he's got elite stuff. And he showcased it in this at bat. We're like, I don't care what the count is. You saw it against Ben Miller, a nasty fastball with a lot of two seam action, a big, you know, big league slider that's got crazy horizontal break. Um, and those six, six runs against Miami, five runs against Wake Forest, which, oh, ho hum, two top 25 teams and mm -hmm. two of the best offenses, not only the ACC, but the country as well. And another good battle brewing here. Stays a ball and two strikes on Bravo, who has doubled, knocked in a run, struck out, and brought home a run with a sacrifice fly in that big four-run fourth inning for the Blue Devils. Duke at 18 and seven overall, and trying to get to 500 in the ACC at four and five. And another foul ball. Uh, we were talking with, with Chris Pollard. I mean, the schedule maker did them no favors. I guess most ACC teams can say that because as good of a league as it is, but Wake Forest, Clemson, NC State, and then Virginia have been their four series so far. That just missed. But to your point, I mean, that's the cream of the crop, right? You, you get the reigning, I guess, three seed in the country, Wake Forest, who, who just finished on the outside of the national championship a year ago. Clemson, who's been maybe the biggest surprise in the country to this point, too, who's gotten off to a blistering start with just two losses heading into this weekend. Have been through the gauntlet of it only halfway through. And I think Bravo went around, he thought so too, as he turns and heads away, and Teal's got himself his second strikeout. Offense that, as you can see, has been red hot. 10 plus hits, just the two tonight. But they're averaging double-digit runs per game as well. They've been held at just two. I want to make sure that this is more of an emphasis on how good Santucci and Talon have been for Duke. And he'll face Ference, Godbout Anderson here in the seventh. We were having the conversation about, do you bring Talon back for another inning? Uh, you were in the affirmative on that, which is what's happened, right? Yeah, it, we saw a really similar outing last week against NC State where he did go to two innings, just gave up one hit and had the three strikeouts. The conversation being, hey, do you, do you go back to the pen, find another righty, change it up a little bit, but to our Southern crowd, forgive me, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, y'all, come on. <laughs> the lefties have been nasty tonight for the Blue Devils. Where are you from? I know, Charleston, South Carolina. That, that sounded it. I know. It did. Well, into it yeah. That's going to be a clean base hit to center field to start the seventh inning for Jacob Ferentz, who's on for the Cavaliers. And there's their third hit of the game. There's one of the few mistakes that we've seen elevated up in the zone, and there's that Virginia offense that just doesn't miss pitches. Right, slide, slider that just kind of leaks out over the plate. Such a quiet swing. Like, watch the load in the lower half all on time together as clinical swing. Parents now with an 11 game hitting streak. Henry Godbout takes high for ball one. He has one of the other hits for Virginia, an RBI single back in the second. He's one for two. That's at the knees. Good pitch there. One ball, one strike. Virginia in uh, Duke infield looking for a ground ball at somebody here. And slap foul out of play. God, who played close to 51 starts a season ago. He became their go-to second base when hitting 286 a year ago, off to a great start this year. High in the air to left field, Winslow might not have seen it right off the bat, but it's going to hang up there for him, and he makes the catch. I think that's what you were talking about last inning, about the lights not entirely taking effect. It looked like he froze in his footsteps for a second there, but still had plenty of time to find the baseball make a catch. Do you remember as Megan Winslow takes a look at his scouting report and will shift as so for Ethan Anderson. This was a defensive catcher that right. Coach Pollard said, hey, this is our guy behind the plate. This is the catcher of the future that's still getting a lot of run behind the plate, but getting to learn from a guy like Alex Stone who's been there, done that, still doing it. 
but his bat has kept him in the lineup. So, you know, Mike Winslow, who was their everyday catcher in high school and just his freshman year, is channeling into a little bit of that travel ball action. Hey, coach, I'll go play left, go play right. The bat's going to play. Get me in the game, coach. That just misses. On Ethan Anderson. Speaking of catchers, DH rolled tonight. To third and off of the glove of Miller and down the line. Around second is Ferentz. He's going to get to third and he's going to slip and he'll have to go back to the bag. I think he was coming home until his feet came out from underneath him and he dives back in safely at third. Maybe it's a huge trip and fault because to me they were, were executing a perfect relay from that corner. Call it a hit, call it an error as that ball was stung down the line. Crew here, but look, he puts on the stop late. So that's exactly what happened. He's waving, he's waving, and they execute that relay so cleanly that it's a load of Hansen. Second and third with one down. To shortstop, Clark makes the play to first. That will score the run to make it an 8-3 game, but Talon will certainly take that, and so will Duke. No doubt. And, and two, right, I understand that they opt to send Talon back out for a second inning of work. You almost turn into a starting pitcher here in the back half of the game where you can go bridge this thing and put the final nail in. To me, he's keeping the ball in the zone. Find force contact. You just don't want to allow this potent offense to take big swings with lots of runners on. He hasn't walked anybody. Hey, they hit you around, fine. It means you just weren't were executing pitches, but you did stay within the zone, which is what he's done here in the top of the set. Now he'll try and get Griff O'Farrell at the top of the order. Overthrew that one and falls behind. Two balls and no strikes. Cavaliers get a little bit closer, now down five with two outs here in the seventh. In the air down the right field line, Bravo with a long run to the Virginia bullpen. Can't make the play. So two balls and one strike on O'Farrell who has lined to left, fly to right and grounded out, knocking in a run. So officially he is 0 for 3 with a 14 game hitting streak on the line. To center field, Ob coming in and he makes the one handed catch to end the top half of the seventh inning. Cavaliers do get a run in the frame. An elevator roll in a lot of lefty lefty spots specifically as you can see it's a big looping breaking ball difficult for the lefties to take advantage of is they'll have the switch hitter Wallace Clark on deck so it won't face necessarily a lefty in this spot but to me it's it's showing faith in a guy that hey we're going to maybe need you to take on a little bit of a bigger role uh, than you did last year. Mm -hmm. Alex Stone one for three singled back in the first inning. And he lines that ball into right center field. It drops for a base hit. Getting to it quickly was Salky in right center field and Stone with his second hit of the game. Doesn't he just feel like he's starting to heat up? Mm -hmm. Watch him sink into this back hip. This is a really nice sinker down in the zone. He stays within that back hip, goes down and gets it. It's like a seven iron, just a little punch shot underneath the trees in the right center field. And you know, we'll talk to Coach Potter a little bit too. A little bit of a slower start for Alex Stone, just hitting 255 coming in today. He told us this has always been a second half player. I think there were a lot of coaches around the ACC that went, dang it. When Alex Stone didn't get a call in the MLB draft last summer, I think to the surprise of many, this has been one of the most productive catchers in the entire country. He's a really big kid, really athletic for his size as well. The bat's heating up, and he's going to be a steal for any organization at the professional level. And what a mainstay he has been here, right? I mean, he is one of those, like, lifelong Duke guys, right? He could run for mayor, it feels like, <laughs> you know, on campus. Uh, but, you're like, in the world of the portal, you need guys like Alex Stone to, to not only, right, when you bring in guys like Ben Miller and Bravo and Bielensen and these portal-type dudes, you need somebody to, like, let you know, like, hey, this is how we kind of handle our business here, someone that's walked the walk and talked the talk and um, 
you know, a leader by not only action, which he's done on the field, but by voice as well. Yep. I think you've just defined catcher. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Webster's Dictionary yes. states catcher as mm -hmm. face of Alex Stone. Three balls, one strike here on Wallace Clark, who has walked twice, singled part of that bottom of the order that's been so productive, and he has scored a couple of runs. And that's on the outside corner, much to the dismay of Clark. He's been so locked into the plate, maybe a little preemptive, but. So a full count pitch coming here with Stone at first base, nobody out in the bottom of the seventh. Well, I think we're going to correct the scoreboard. Thought I saw our home plate umpire, Jeff Gosney, motion the count. Well, let's go with three and two and see what happens. <laughs> I thought I saw three and one, but let's go three, two. Well, now it's definitely three and two. Leave it, a, <laughs> Leave it we, there. We appreciate it, Mr. <laughs> Clark. Thank you. <laughs> Making Winslow in the background, waiting on deck. And the three, two. And that is ball four. And the Blue Devils with a couple more base runners. He's been fantastic tonight. I'm glad that we, we threw up that graphic going into the inning to kind of display how talented this kid is. Another guy that's maybe gotten off to a little bit of a slower start from the idea that when you look at it macro level at the numbers, you might say hadn't been a great season. But when you really dive in deep, an OBP of 422 for a guy just hitting 254, right? That speaks volumes. You know, at OU, he was a part of that team that went to Omaha, that beat Virginia Tech in that Blacksburg Super Regional. He's a guy that comes with winning pedigree to Durham, and he's fitted perfectly. Mm -hmm. So two on, nobody out, and here is Macon Winslow. 0 for 2, has scored a run. And the Blue Devils looking to get some more here. This is low. Maybe in the spot too, right? The book says first, second, nobody out. Let's go ahead and lay down a bunt. But an opportunity for a guy to break out of a little bit of a slump mm -hmm. and try to split a gap. Especially with a left-handed pitcher on the mound. Give him a better look here. Two balls and a strike. Blue Devils with eight hits, and they've had runners pretty much all over the place. They've had runners in all but, but a couple of innings. And you don't want to take your foot off the pedal against this Cavalier offense. A little bit of a late swing there. Evens the count of two balls and two strikes. That's kind of what happens when you pitch a guy backwards, right? Spin, spin, and 88 almost. Takes the bat in your hand. So watch the adjustment. He's getting a little bit wider with his lower half and trying to get out in front of the heater. On the 2 2. Fouled it away. We'll try it again. Blue Devils with two in the first, then the beginning was the fourth when they scored four and two more in the fifth. And this potent Cavalier offense has been limited to single runs in the second, fifth, and seventh. And he got him. Goes back to the heater and just kind of, hey, Louisiana, buy you a little bit. <laughs> hey, watch him. He just kind of catch a little bit of a shorter arm action, so it's going to get on him a little bit of a higher spin rate. Just a perfect spot, hides it. Good two-seam fastball, big time out. And this is a Duke team that's hitting 462. We saw the graphic, six for 13 with runners on base. That number will drop a bit, but it's been this bottom half that's been able to pick up the slack and hopefully pick up Winslow. Certainly this guy has. Devin Obi has had a terrific night as he takes strike one. He is two for three, a single, a double. And you see the couple of runs batted in. He's also scored a couple of runs. 
out of the number eight spot. Excuse me, talking to Coach Pollard before the game, too. You know, coming out of that fall and early spring inner squads before they mm -hmm. got ready for opening day, the lineup wasn't settled, but Devin Obi had earned that center field spot because of what he does defensively with that speed. I think the bat was just an added element that maybe surprised him a little bit with how he's been able to do it efficiently. Oh, he just robbed him of a hit there. Luke Hansen to the backhand side to make that catch and took a third hit away from Devin Obi. Well, they don't call, call the hot corner for nothing. I mean, watch how quick this gets on him. Cat Great reflexes. <laughs> then it was so hot he couldn't grab it. I was going to say, you see the, the, the joking tap on third there <laughs> by Luke Hansen, who was the 5A Virginia State football player of the year. He looked like a receiver, even though uh, clearly he's got the sunshine flow. He was QB1. Yes, he does. And he was a stud <laughs> athlete, still is, obviously. But at the high school level, there was a reason that he was a top 10 baseball and football prospect. Mm -hmm. Another guy on this Virginia roster that was a two-way dog. I talk about Jay Wolfolk, who yep. no longer playing football, nope. but was the backup quarterback on the gridiron in the fall for the Cavaliers. Right. But it kind of shows you how they go about the recruiting process. Let's just go get athletes and fill that dugout with absolute talent. All right, two on, two outs. We do have a pinch hitter here. This is Andrew Yu at the plate hitting for Chase Cruson. With the two runners on base. The junior out of Nashville. With a 1-1 count. Back up the middle. Farrell with a nice play. Nice effort. Griffo Farrell, Farrell and makes the flip toss to Godbout for the out at second base. So work two hits. He did give up a run with a strikeout and he gets the Blue Devils into the late innings. And Nard will go to work on the two, three, and four hitters here for Virginia. Whalen, Salky, and Ford for the Cavaliers here in the eighth, although we're going to get a pinch hitter here for Virginia. As Anthony Stefan will bat as Brian O'Connor plays a little bit of right left with a couple of position players, this being one of them. And two balls and one strike. Stefan, one of those kids that comes off the bench hitting 306 on the year, a lot of volume in his at bats. Finally, after back to back lefties, arms for Duke, they go to a righty, and it's time for Stefan to try to just find a way to get on base. With three balls and two strikes on him here, and this is what uh, Brian O'Connor was talking about. He's got like 11 guys that he plays offensively in a rotation that he feels really comfortable with, and Stefan is one of them. We'll see him in the starting lineup, I'm sure, before this weekend is over. They joked on that podcast that they do in-house at Virginia. He said, I, I'm, I'm waiting on the you know, NCAA to <laughs> grant me the ability to start 11 guys in my lineup. Duke's defense had him played perfectly there and will throw him out on the ground ball. There's the versatility of Ben Miller on full display. It's a totally different throw of striking it over from second base versus third, but you've seen Duke really all day against a lot of lefties. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot, obviously, just the one lefty in the lineup with Denwick, but he'll slide over into that kind of just middle hole right over. Uh, again, come on, the analytics have changed the game of college baseball. It started in the major league level, and it's leaked down into the college ranks. Talking with Coach Pollard before the game, he goes, we, we attack and we view the portal kind of like we want to be Tampa, not New York, right? It'd be great that was a great line. Rankings, but it was a great line yep. how they kind of go about their business. And analytically, when you talk about the shift in offensive sabermetrics, they are a lot of Tampa Bay in that sense. Mm -hmm. and of course, the college game not following the major league lead. They're able to do that. They're able to shift and it paid dividends for them now. Wallace Clark circling around that mile-high pop-up, and he grabs it for the second out here in the eighth inning. You can see how what a big laugh of Wallace Clark. You're yeah. right. Yeah. 
I think I got it. I think I got it. I got it. He is, which which brings my attention out left field. I thought he was yelling at uh, Macon Windsor. There's been a defensive sub out in left field as well. It's Tyler Albright messing with his shortstop after what? It seemed like a routine pop fly, not so much. <laughs> he made the catch. There's the new left fielder for Duke. And a quick two strike count on Henry Ford. And did he get him? He did. He got him to go around. What an impressive inning. Here's point of the season. And the top of the order for Duke Buchanan out there for his second inning of work. And Morris takes the first one high for a ball. He's been on base a couple of times, but officially 0 for 2. He's been hit by a pitch and walked. One ball, one strike. Mentioned it being a pivotal matchup. And I know we talked about it in the open, but you know, Duke, who, who's knocking on the doorstep from trying to become you know, a powerhouse of blue blood in the college baseball world. It is funny how when you look at a, a weekend matchup like this and we talk about how challenged and battle-tested they have been through those first three weeks and three teams that we expect to see make a run come tournament time, if it gets a little bit lax down the back half and they can start to take advantage of you know, these Friday night victories with Santucci on the bump, like you can start to stockpile series victories because I think come at the end of this, not only about getting into the tournament, but this is a team that wants to start to host. They had to go play at Coastal Carolina and win that regional in Conway. This could be a weekend from an RPI standpoint where you go, hey, we took care of Virginia at home. We deserve to host a regional here at Jack Coombs Field. Three balls, two strikes on Zach Morris. All of that, the big picture for really both of these teams. Both of these teams want to get to kind of the scenario you were just, you were just talking about. That ball will go foul. Although, <laughs> you didn't you didn't see it there, but waiting, but, but Ferentz actually with a pretty heady play there. That ball kicked off of the off of the turf and started to roll back into fair territory. Everybody had given up on it, but didn't have enough steam. Uh, Chris Pollard was talking about that, right? And we we did mention it that you know they've run the gauntlet to this point. This is a big series for them. They didn't get a chance against Virginia at home last year playing all six of those in Charlottesville. That is ripped to center field. Didawick now in center, dives and makes the catch. Terrific play by the Cavalier center fielder who just moved over from left field, and he plucked it right off of the turf. Let's have a conversation, too. There's no help behind him. This baseball gets by him. You got your leadoff hitter looking for what would be the second inside the park home run on the season for the Duke Blue Devils. The first was Devin Obi in game two of the season and that 11 home run parade, but that's a heck of a play by Didowick in center. And there goes another one to center. He's not going to catch that one except on a hop. That'll be a base hit for Ben Miller, a clean single to center, and he's a one-out base runner. His third hit. It's clinical. Like, watch how he gets through the baseball, stays through the middle of the field. He's done it all afternoon. I mean, too much plate for too talented a hitter. Well, let's see. What did I say? That's three hits in five at bat. So he's 15 for his last 28. And a seven-game hit streak. And a one-out base runner. And that's high for ball one. Gracia 0 for 3, did knock in a run without lifting the bat from his shoulder with a bases loaded walk back in the fourth. And that misses a little low. On the other hand, Jack, Virginia's schedule hasn't been quite as demanding as Duke's, right, to this point. And they are coming off of that weekend sweep at Pittsburgh, and I thought that was really interesting when we were talking with Coach O'Connor. He was he was really pleased with that three-game sweep. That was not, you know, Wake Forest. It was not Duke. Uh, it was not Clemson. But to go to Pitt, where for all their success, they have struggled, and to sweep that series and to have the pitching, the hitting, and the fielding all play well, you could tell he really liked what his team did in Pittsburgh. 
Well, they don't call them Gritsburg for nothing. It's a tough <laughs> place to go play. You know, there's not a ton of energy, especially at this time of the year. Coach Connor said, it may have been the coldest I've ever been sitting in a dugout that Saturday up at Pittsburgh. So how does your group respond, right? Like, hey, we're going to usher them in and, and let them know, hey, like, there needs to be a conversation about, like, you have to supply your own energy on days like that. That's exactly what they did. Um, and it kind of rolls into another weekend where cake and you can not only remain above 500 in conference play, but they have a unique position of being able to maybe run away with it with a series dub. They outscored the Panthers 36 to eight in those three games. So they hit the ball, they pitched the ball, they caught it. It was their first series win at Pittsburgh since 2016. Now they only go there, obviously not every year, but still that that's a pretty long, pretty long drought. Gracia draws his second walk of the game. And the Blue Devils with two on and one out for Logan Bravo. Really nice that bat from Gracia. Mm -hmm. You saw UVA had kind of had him shifted. And sometimes when you're young in your career, you can allow that shift to start to play mental head games with you. He's taking his walks tonight. Allowed the heart of this lineup to hit with a lot of runners on. Which is the case here. Two on with one out. Bravo swings through the first one. He was trying to make it double digits with that swing. <laughs> <laughs> trying to give us our first home run of the game. He said, yippee ki -yay, let's get this thing going, <laughs> boys and girls. Instead, he's down 0-1. Now he's down 0-2. Take that big swing, 0-1, or 0-0. Mm -hmm. Then as a pitcher, I'm like, oh, watch this. I'm going to freeze you with the pitch you were looking for on that first one. Have you thinking? Got him in an 0-2 hole. Thought about it, didn't go. Good take, and it's a ball and two strikes. Bravo with a couple of RBIs tonight. Out of that cleanup spot, the Harvard transfer. Runners at first and second and a 1-2 pitch. And off of the mitt of Ference to the backstop. The runners will move up to second and third. Looked like he might have gotten crossed up a little bit on that pitch. Let's see if they have a good conversation about it. Because that was really the first pitch. I've been impressed with Buchanan. It's the first one that really gets away from us. It kind of, you can see, hits off of the heel of the glove. Not sure if he broke more than anticipated or maybe it backed up on him late, but crucial pass ball in that spot where now the double play no longer in order. And the infield will have to come up. So Bravo's got some more room to try and punch a ball through here on two and two. And that just missed. See the infield up, the outfield playing a little bit around the left. Big gap there in right center. Payoff pitch. Just missed high. Ball four and the bases are loaded. There's that crafty 12-6 south ball breaking ball that kind of fooled me upstairs. It looked like it caught the top of the zone. And in an interesting shift, too, we mentioned that he hit a backside homer against NC State about six days ago. So maybe something in the scouting pull with the lefty on the mound. Now the base is loaded with one out and the veteran, Alex Stone, at the plate. That's low, ball one. Stone creeping up Duke's all-time home run list. Tied for fifth now with 33 career homers. If you're thinking about such a thing here with the bases loaded. As you said, it's kind of the one thing we haven't had tonight. <laughs> Got a good swing there and fouled it off. On the other hand, Virginia would like him to pound the ball into the dirt at somebody and get out of the inning escaped all night. It felt like their backs mm -hmm. had been up against the wall since really that first inning, but to no surprise, I know this game we've seen anything, but with both of these coaches in each dugout, like, 
we've gotten a super fundamental opening night for this weekend set. Two balls and one strike. Duke's left seven runners on base. It actually feels like more than that. It really does. I, Plus, kinda... they've scored eight runs, though, so that, that's a lot of base runners. Yeah, I think the Duke pen has come in after four walks from Santucci. They haven't allowed a free base yet. Um, I, I think that'll be a conversation, which has been all year for Virginia, where they've given up eight free passes. That's in the air to left center. Stefan now in left field will line this one up and make the catch. Miller tags, comes down the line from third, and he will score to make it a 9-3. Duke lead, gives Stone the run batted in on the sacrifice fly. And again, just a nice off-speed pitch to get him out on the front side, just enough to elevate something up in the air. Another sack fly for the Blue Devils. Is, I've been impressed with the stuff on the mound. Matthew Buchanan, who, like, he's worked himself into jams, but he's done enough to be able to get out of him and limit the big crooked number. Mm -hmm. Working on his second full inning of relief here. He's got two outs and runners at first and second for Wallace Clark. One strike, and you just used the word fundamental a moment ago and wasn't that fundamental baseball. I mean, Alex Stone didn't do too much. He just drove the ball where he had to put it in order to get a run home. You keep waiting for them to you know, bash a double with the bases loaded and score a couple, but it's really just kind of, hey, move a runner, sacrifice fly, you know, take an extra base on, on a dirt ball read or, you know, an, inf uh, in an infield fielder's choice that moves the runner and then the next guy gets the job done. It, it hasn't all happened at once, but, you know, that big crooked number and obviously the bottom of the fourth was taking advantage on a couple free passes at the end of the line for Cullen McKay. And Duke hasn't looked back since. Runners are going, and the pitch is fouled on the first base side. Ford coming over. He'll run out of room. And on cue, maybe nothing so fundamental about a double steal with two outs, but <laughs> it's clearly on the lefty. Yeah, he never looked back. Great jump there at, at second by Gracia. Would have had it stolen. So the runners go back to first and second. Two strikes on Clark. Ooh. And drives that one, but well foul. I, I don't think he could have kept that one fair, Jack. That no, was that, way that, in on him. That break ball was going to hit him. <laughs> yeah, if he didn't ball. swing at it. Yeah. This is for all, all, all former players. They remember offset BP where, like, your coaches would line up down the first base side of your right or down the left field side, and your challenge is to try to find a way to keep it in play. Uh, he just hit that 500 feet uh, that might be sitting on the lacrosse field. <laughs> And he got handcuffed on that one, and I think it's going to be a foul ball. <laughs> Coach O'Connor coming out of the dugout hot. Yeah, he doesn't like that call. He thought, I think he thought it was a swing and a miss, right? And it was a late call. It's almost like a short arm action, like he's throwing like a catcher. So it might only say 87, but in the box, Wells Clark making it look like it's 97. Oh, we better get out of the way of that one, no matter how fast it was. <laughs> I'm with you, especially up six. Yeah. Don't tell anybody I'm telling you this, but I was terrified of getting hit. I hated it, <laughs> especially with a big lead. I'm trying to, like, swing, elevate, and celebrate. I don't think bit. you're alone. I'm not trying to get hit. I don't care if it was a fastball or a breaking ball. Now a 1-2 pitch. Runners go again, and a big swing on a high fastball. And Buchanan finishes it with Nard still out there, and he throws a couple of quick strikes to Harrison Didowick, and it's quickly nothing in two. So the Blue Devils trying to get the upper hand in this series. And I don't know, Jack, maybe it was circled on their calendar after last year. I know they've got a lot of new parts to their team, but to take the first game in this series against Virginia, if they can get these three outs, they'd have to feel pretty good going into Friday and Saturday. You know what? How excited was Jonathan Santucci? Had to sit and watch, injured as his team was taken out in the Super Regional matchup, to be able to come back, make a statement, get a huge win after and they struggled a little bit in the last two weeks and get a much needed first win in this ACC series. But Harrison Didowick opens the ninth with a single in front of Devin Obi in center field. 
So he's got his first hit of the game, fifth for the Cavaliers, and he's a leadoff base runner here in the ninth. How excited is Didwick to finally not have a lefty on yeah. the mound? Right? <laughs> I mean, this kid has been lights this year. 353 with 12 homers. Those 40 RBIs has got him across in the country right in that top five spot. Uh, just to finally see a righty on the mound, he gets to take a big, deep breath and go, all right, I'm, I get, we're good. We're okay. Yep. And he came through with the base hit. Now Jacob Ferentz. Extended hit sitting streak to 11 with a single his last time up and scored a run. He's behind here, no balls and two strikes. Duke fans at home just yelling at their TVs, telling us to stop talking about the cardiac calves if they've experienced a couple <laughs> of those heartbreaking losses when they gave up seven in the NC State mm -hmm. a week ago. But, I mean, it, it goes without saying, now in their 26th game this year for Virginia, they've trailed in 19 of which they would need their fifth come from behind victory with trailing by four or more runs and Herculean would be the perfect moniker for it but not out of question and that skips off of the glove of Alex Stone and Didowick will advance to second and a 1-2 count now on Ferentz charge a pass ball to Alex Stone Two balls and two strikes. It really is amazing that they are 21 and four with the numbers you just rattled off about how many games they have trailed. And as you said, in many of them, it wasn't just by a run in the first inning, anything like that. It was multiple runs into the middle innings of games. I think we learned a lot about them in that Jacksonville Division mm. One bas baseball classic. Wichita State, Auburn, and they go beat some really talented teams that have continued to be really successful following that tournament. Two hopper to short. Wallace Clark makes the play to first. Didowick advances to third. One down here in the ninth. Clearly Duke knows if they're able to secure this victory tonight. At Virginia, that firepower ain't going nowhere, right? I, we talked about it. The least amount of hits on the season was five against Wake Forest back on March 16th. They've just got five after Denewick let off the inning with a single. So a relatively quiet night. But if you think about that Wake matchup, that was against Chase Burns. Tonight was against Jonathan Tan mm -hmm. Tucci. Those are two of the best arms in the country. Henry Godbot at the plate. Godbot at the plate, one for three. RBI single back in the second. Blue Devils obviously will give up a run if they can get an out here with the runner at third and one away. We'll do it again tomorrow night, again at 6 o'clock here in Durham, and then the Saturday finale at 1 o'clock, matinee baseball. Ball and two strikes. On the left side, cut off by Miller. Fires across in time to get God Bout. They will get the RBI. There are two down here in the ninth. Such an impressive play by Ben Miller. We mentioned a little bit of a shuffling of the deck in those early season scrimmages. It's, it's hilarious to think when Coach Pollock told us we weren't so sure about that infield. We, we had Ben Miller playing a lot of first. It was more set short, and, and Clark over at third. And they, it's crazy to think that this might be the most consistent infield in the entire country from a productivity standpoint as well. To left field, and that will do it. The Duke Blue Devils set the tone for this three-game series amongst nationally ranked teams. They just